My name is Jeff Ball, and I'm at the Steyer Taylor Center for Energy Policy and Finance here at Stanford, which is um, uh, jointly based at the Law and Business Schools. And uh, as you know from, from seeing the advertisement about this session, um, we have Peter Xie here uh, from GCL, Poly, and Terry Wong from Trina Solar. Um, and I will tell you a little bit about them, a little more about them in a minute, and then we'll get into a discussion, and then we will have room for plenty of time for your questions. Let me just take a couple of minutes here and try to frame this discussion so that there's some sense to what we're going to talk about. I, I, I want to do two things at the outset that I did last time, um, just to sort of a couple housekeeping things. I want to thank some colleagues whose help has been really instrumental in making this series possible. Um, the uh, folks at the Precord Institute, uh, at the Woods Institute, and at the Steyer Taylor Center have just been great. And without their interest and support in all this, we wouldn't all be here today. Um, in particular, I want to thank Lee Johnson and Sonny uh, Wang at the uh, Precord Institute. Um, and uh, my colleague Dan Riker at the Steyer Taylor Center, who have been um, great supporters of this all along. Um, I obviously want to thank Terry and Peter for making the trek here. In fact, uh, their trek today was not so long because they, as you'll hear, they spend quite a lot of time in the valley. Um, uh, but uh, they're both about to get on planes in the next 24 hours for long trips. Um, the, la the, the last housekeeping thing I'd say is um, uh, if you are uh, a tweeter, um, please tweet liberally. Uh, there's a fairly full house here today, but lots of interest beyond this room in the discussion that we're going to have. It's not every day that you get two pretty high-ranking executives from some of the largest solar companies, two of the largest solar companies in the world. So if you want to tweet, tweet at hashtag Stanford Rising Power, and we'll see, uh, see what we have at the end of this session. Um, let me just say two other kind of substantive things. First is, um, as I said last time, this series is going to be structurally different from th th this, this seminar is going to be structurally different from the uh, typical energy seminar in the sense that we're not going to have PowerPoint presentations. You're not going to see many slides up there. Uh, we're going to have a discussion here. And we're not going to be talking about sort of the intricacies of science, uh, although we will obviously talk about technological pathways. What we're really going to be doing is talking about following the money. Um, because uh, I think that's what these guys are expert in. And um, obviously, what we're going to be talking about is the extent to which technologies that you've heard a lot about are being deployed and deployed profitably. Um, as I said, la the last thing I'll say by way of repetition is that um, the basic premise of this session is that what happens uh, in China on energy over the next couple of decades matters more to the world, to the world's energy markets, and to the world's environment probably than what any other single country does, and perhaps more than what the conglomeration of other countries around the world does. Um, so we want to come out of this understanding in a lot more detail what's happening in China. So um, what's going on in China is a fascinating microcosm, not just of the world's push for clean energy, but of the world's struggle to deploy clean energy in an, in an economically efficient way. And I think what these guys are going to talk to us about today is two things. One, about the fairly gaping economic inefficiencies in the way China has gone about scaling up solar. Uh, and, and right now, about China's attempts to rationalize that, um, to, 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 to restructure this industry so that it's economically efficient for the long haul. Um, uh, and so I, what I want to do is just, uh, let me just introduce them, and then we will jump in here. So, um, so these two gentlemen have similar backgrounds. Both of them grew up in China. Both of them went to college in China, uh, Peter at uh, Tsinghua and Terry at Fudan University. Uh, both of them went to graduate school in the US, Peter at uh, the University of Michigan, and Terry uh, got a master's at Brown and an MBA at the University of Wisconsin. Um, both, of, both of them after school spent the early parts of their careers working in Silicon Valley and in China in the telecommunications industry, the tech, technology industry. And then um, both of them jumped into solar um, uh, in the late 2000s at a time when solar was going gangbusters um, and uh, have ridden the roller coaster of the solar industry for the past five or six years. Um, so um, just one bit about their companies. Trina and GCL uh, are both mature Chinese industrial companies that entered the solar industry late. Trina is a company that was founded and made construction materials. GCL, GCL built and builds power plants, including, including coal-fired power plants, and got into solar, as these guys will tell you, uh, essentially riding the solar industry. Um, and uh, the last thing I'll say by way of introduction is just a little bit of the sort of hard-nosed financial information so that we're all talking straight and on the same page here. So Trina went public in early 2007. Trina hit a high of about 36 a share later in 2007. 
And this morning when I checked, Trina was trading below five. Um, Trina reported revenue in 2012 of 1.3 billion US dollars, down about one third from 2011. And Trina reported in 2012 a net loss of $267 million, which was about eight times the, the net profit that Trina reported in 2011. So you see the trajectory, and that Trina is not an anomaly here. Trina is representative of an industry. So GCL went public in 2008. Uh, the stock was trading at about five per share. Um, it rose in, two, in, in uh, 2011 to about six. This morning, when I checked, it was trading at below two. Um, and Trina and uh, GCL's, GCL's financials have followed a similar trajectory to GCL's, that, uh, to Trina's, that is a net loss um, in the case of GCL, a net loss in 2012 following a net profit in 2011. So a very, very difficult time in the industry that these guys operate, and I think they'll be very straight with us about that. So let me stop yakking, and let's just, uh, let's just, let's just jump in here. The first thing I want to ask you guys is um, one of the reasons that I'm happy that you're here is that um, as I've come to talk to you, it's clear that you're both straight talkers. Okay. And I think the question on everyone's mind here is SunTech as we jump in here. So just to kind of break the ice, what happened at SunTech? And what does what happened at SunTech say about the future of the industry that you guys work in? Okay, um, SunTech actually, um, SunTech, uh, the background of SunTech is the first listed in US and from China and solar sector. Back then it was like a superstar and uh, their goal was, I mean, taking largest market share and no matter what, and the uh, been through uh, many years, and uh, given that uh, the market fluctuated, their decisions and some laws come with the uh, the, the the decision made. And uh, the, right now, uh, they come to uh, the bankrupt protection. So that's with the the current status. So that, um, but before that, we have to understand in China background the economy. Uh, you know, the player and the bank and government, what's the relationship? So it's make it short, because China environment, business enterprise level, and the barely people want to take bankruptcy, because bankruptcy is losing face, they do anything want to prevent it. And bank doesn't want the, the company, the finance, and go to bankrupt. And government, does, local government want to protect them too. So it's bankruptcy come to this point. It's in no other way around, no other choice. They have to, so that's the last choice for that. So it's how difficult the decision is made. I um, think, yeah, good, yeah, so maybe I'd like to add to Terry's point. I think Suntech is a typical company that going to overextend themselves. You know, you know in a uh, business case, you should not you know, over leverage. You know, when the time is good, the leveraging is good, right? But you know, they can leverage can you know amplify itself when the you know time is bad. I think if you look at the SunTax, you know, the way how they leverage, they uh, invest maybe uh, less than what two hundred million dollars. Yeah. The uh, the leverage, you know, the leverage, the borrowing is over two billion dollars. So not much of a stockholder equity, a lot of you know like borrowed money. So you you know when you, the time is good, really making amplify the the, the, the benefits. So, so, so the time so, is bad, then it's coming coming down on you. We're gonna get in. We're gonna take a few minutes in in an, in a few minutes to kind of try to deconstruct what happened in the anatomy of the Chinese solar industry to understand the terms that you're talking yeah. about to understand the role of banks right. and other institutions. But before we do that, just as a general proposition, what does the SunTech bankruptcy say? about the future of the Chinese solar industry more broadly and the future of the viability of solar even more broadly. Because I think it's not too cute to say that in this country there's a general sense that the SunTech bankruptcy mm. is emblematic of the death of, of the Chinese solar industry and more broadly the, the, the death of, of sort of the optimism about solar uh, even more broadly than that. Is that fair? Yeah. yeah. I think that uh, if we look at the, the bankruptcy itself, this, this kind of case uh, represent and actually, actually imply the positive and negative uh, to a different the class of the uh, you know, people. And uh, for solar sec sector itself, 
I think is a positive, and because that's give the signal to the investors, and we up call to the to government, to local banks that, you know, the 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 business model that the Centex running is not working because that's suicide themselves going going forward. If you don't um, have any core competency to be more competitive and running the the business as it should be run to be maximize the company uh, the value instead of just the go expand it. So you think, this, you think the Suntec bankruptcy is sort of a wake up call to the Chinese financial system that right. something has to change and that we're now, we're not, what we're now gonna see is a kind of rationalization of right. this industry right. Um, right. And, and sort of stage two. Absolutely, right. I think I would, I would add to that, if you look at the, uh, the Suntec bankruptcy, I think that's a certainly a wake up call and uh, I think, but in the, in the look at the solar industry as a whole, I think actually we are actually, industry is still very, you know, I don't think it's a death of the industry because if you look at supply demand, the demand is still going up every year. You know, we're, we're, we're more, you know, it's just supply demand out of balance, right? Next year gonna be even more, more than 10% double digit growth going on for the next few years. So I think for the industry is still going very uh, healthy. The only, only problem is the supply demand is out of, out of sync. That's the only problem. And to be clear, let's just put some numbers on this in terms of the supply and demand being out of sync. Global, global supply uh, of, of, of polysilicon-based PV modules and cells is what, about 60 gigawatts a year, 55, 60 gigawatts a year? Yeah. Supply, yeah. And demand is what? About 30, half gigaw about 30, 30 gigawatts. Yeah. So essentially double, what the, the world is cranking out double what the world is consuming. And the Correct. question is, Correct. how does that get sopped up? Yeah. Correct. Right. You know, the capacity also have to put in concept, the effective capacity and the capacity as a whole. So the 60 gigawatts is include all the capacity right now out there in the market. But it's current running because of the readjustment this from supply side to reflect the demand, it's been some of the, the capacity we already readjusted by shutting down the product line and, and by underutilize the capacity. So that's uh, come to and you add the inventories jam in the channel. So that's mm -hmm. why they readjust the so, so first of all, they have to do readjust, redigest the, uh, the inventory in the channel. At the same time, now, as I said, you know, this couple of quarters become a turning point because the, uh, the inventory in the channel has been and yeah. pretty much is consumed out. And, uh, and a lot of companies back into the, you know, increase fully utilized uh, <coughs> capacity mode. So you see bright mm -hmm. signs. Yeah. Okay, so let's hold that thought and let's now walk back and let's, t let's sort of go through the history of this. So you guys both entered the solar industry in roughly 2007, 2008. These were gangbuster times, right? These, these, were, sure. these were great times for the solar industry. And so let's kind of do this in stages. Why don't you, each of you, take the period 2007, 2008 to 2010. Walk us through, explain to us, not broadly, but in the context of GCL and in the context of Trina, what was it like then? What was going on at your specific companies then? Let me come on early, because I joined yeah. this uh, industry a little bit early. Okay. <laughs> uh, joined the Trina at the beginning of 2008. There was, uh, back then, you can see that uh, robust demand in Europe driven. And I remember our sales export to Europe had taken about more than 95%. 95% of the panels Trina was creating were being exported Europe. to Europe. Yeah. And, uh, Based on subsidies in Europe at that that's point. That's correct. Right. That's correct. And uh, the subsidies and the uh, policy has been initiated by the German government <laughs> and with the feeding tariff. So, and back then, if you look at the, just give you an example. And we, the time we announced in, in public and uh, uh, traded in, in the New York Exchange, our capacity within 100 megawatts. So, so small, but our trading volume is so big. This is when you were doing your IPO. Yeah. Mm. So in other words, when we, the price at the time, ASP for the module per watt base is about $4. ASP, dollars. average selling price of the yeah, modules. that's right. correct. And now, the price of ASP is down to like 60, 65 cents per watt. You can see only matter about five or six years it's down to, so on a, on a on Kegel basis, about like 40, 45% come down anyway. And so what was, so Trina's capacity when you joined, Trina's capacity to produce uh, solar cells and modules was what, roughly, in 2008? Uh, you're talking about the capacity? Yeah. At that time, it's about 
between 100 and 150 megawatts. And what was it in 2010? It's already about uh, 1.5 gigawatts already. Okay, yeah. a massive increase, yeah. right? Massive increase. But and and yeah. what were profits during that period like? Good, bad? Oh, that, that's good. Until uh, we've been through 2008, the fourth quarter, last quarter of 2008, the financial crisis. Then we get over in by the second half of 2009. In the 2010, actually the market doubled or what it was in the 2009 and the 100% growth. And uh, so by 2010, in China itself, we, our revenue is about 1.9 billion US dollars. Our net profit is about 320 million so by the time. And uh, I think just- so You're talking about 20% yeah. margins roughly. Yeah, almost. Extraordinary, right? Yeah. Okay, so stop there. Yeah. So we're at 2010 and then we're gonna see what happens next. But let's talk about GCL. So yeah. walk us through that same period of GCL. So actually, maybe we just uh, give you a general sense of uh, the solar industry. I think uh, solar industry, you know, if you look at uh, the, the system it's designed, it's a feeding tariff system. The feeding tariff system is doing what it's supposed to do, to do is reduce uh, the, the price every now and then. Actually, solar actually going you know, up and down because of the policies. In 2008, you have uh, you know, uh, you know, actually a, a bad times. 2009 and 10 is a very good time because the demand and supply is unbalanced. In 2011, it's supply and demand unbalanced again, right? So that's, so I think that the system is doing the jobs, just the investors getting out of control. That's what, I, that's what I'm thinking. Okay, so, so in 2010, times were good and then suddenly something bad happened in 2011. Yeah. Essentially, Europe, Europe, the, the Europe pulled back on, yeah. on subsidies and uh, there was, there was at the, just at the same time that massive, over, massive capacity that Chinese uh, panel makers had, had installed yeah. came yeah. online, right? Yeah. And yeah. so this is when we've seen a really difficult time yeah. in the industry. So explain to us, um, what, how has that been financed? Okay. How has the expansion within China been financed? Who was, who was providing the liquidity in the market? At the time, see, um, because of such a mass growth, a growth in the, in the industry in China and the, the bank and the investment and coming flash into this field and uh, with expectation 100% growth. And uh, so from entire value chain from upstream, you know, manufacturing capacity build up quickly. And, uh, yes. and then in 20, uh, 2011, the, the demand is not fast enough as people expected. So only by like a 20% growth. And so then suddenly the over, oversupply and taking place, then the price are coming down. I think that it's, it's really a matter of fact of a Suntag effect, right? Suntag, the guy, uh, you know, the Mr. Xi, right? He, uh, you know, did this, uh, you know, uh, startup. And overnight he become, the, you know, the wealthiest man in China. So that really become a big, you know, a publicity you know, doing solar within a few years, you can be the wealthiest man in China. And if the bank look at the return, they say, hey, I invest $100 million, I get my return back within 18 months. Why not? Let's do that, right? Because all the government is about job creations, about tax revenues, and the Suntag is, you know, it's big kind of a flagship things, you know, doing that in a few years, you create the wealthiest man in China, you create a big factory, you know, employ, you know, uh, you know, tens of thousands of people, you create a lot of tax revenue, then everybody is jumping on the bandwagons. It became a, like a herd effect. That causing the 2011 going, you know, gangbuster. Because I can remember there is like every city I go, there is the PV centers, right? There's, you know, the government officials say, hey, you come here, you deploy a factory, I give you, you know, loans. I give you, you know, incentives, you know, no tax for five years, you know, tax, you know, cutting half in the next five years. And everything is just, uh, you know, uh, get the, really the sound tech effect is really, you know, a lot of to blame because the men, Suntag, the Mr. Xi was on the newspaper every day as the you know, number, one com number one people in, so, in China. So when you're going around in 2009, 2010, and you're going to prov provincial capitals and you're getting offered this money or, or cheap money to build factories, does it occur to you at that point that this is a bubble that's going to burst? Yes, actually, it occurred. I was at the, you know, uh, Hanhua Solar Run at the time. We were give, you know, offering the same amount of money. You know, I remember Dr. Xi and both of us were on the same panel. We talked about the oversupplies. But the, the question is, what do you do? As yes, your peers, all your, all your peers are you know, taking the money, they're taking the cheap capital, they extend themselves. If you don't do it, you just become you know, not relevant. 
So you have no choice to try to follow, right? Because there at the gigawatt level, you have the 100 megawatt. If you don't follow, you're just not relevant there. You know, you, you have no choice. So it's a race I, to be I big. told uh, Mr. Xi, I said, you know, I know it's going to be a gun, you know, going to be a gun buster. It's going to be bust sometimes. But right now, I have no choice. You are going so big, I cannot uh, not follow you because it will be, I'll be irrelevant. So if you want to play the gambling, let's just gamble together, right? So, you just, <laughs> there, are no, they, they, there are no choice. I just want to add, uh, yeah, because in China, the, the founder, um, we call the founder, the, uh, the patent, whatever, the, it's really want to be bigger. And uh, they want to take a market share as much as they can. Uh, so borrow money is one of the things that the, the, they think the least, because they think that if they don't borrow money, they don't expand the capacity, they narrow their speed, uh, the limits on, on, on growth. And they cannot accept that uh, the situation. So that's why in China, and you, you have to have a companion, companion story that convinces the bank that uh, number one, the solar sector is grow unlimited. No, well, you can't say I'm there. Fast growth and the future renewables, energies. And secondly, you know, your company in God your core competency that can support the growth. And you become a number one in a few years. So the banks, and, uh, and they don't have a record to track in the past. They, they, they believe in some of the analysis you've done and they show them. Then they give you the money. Yeah, because not, if you, not, not yeah. at all hard to get the money from the banks in this period. No, yeah, because if you look at the China, the, uh, the history of the Chinese success the last 10 years, 10 to 20 years, it's all about the massive skills. So China has been really, you know, you know, kind of drinking its own Kool-Aid because it's doing a massive skills, massive factory, you're getting money very quick. In the beginning, it was very successful. There are a lot of massive factory like SunTag, right? You're getting money earned back within 18 months. So there's no reason for them not to take the money. The money is not on any collateral. It's just, uh, you know, hey, it's just you put, you know, you say, can you show, me, show them a business plan? You bought all this equipment, you know, so why not? I'm doing it. I should just do it, right? So there's a lot of um, you know, incentive to do it big and faster, so, you know, leverage it big. So, so this is fascinating. Um, so let's move forward a little bit in the history and then we'll come to the present. So in late 2011, the trade tariff dispute erupts and it gets more intense throughout last year. And we're now about to hit a milestone in this where widespread expectations are that next month in June, the European Union is going to levy tariffs on imported Chinese panels into the EU, just like uh, the US has done over the past year. So I, I guess I want to ask each of you what you think about the wisdom or lack of wisdom of that approach. And second of all, how it's just affecting your company. What, what you yeah. do, good or bad, uh, yeah. I th uh, yeah. Okay, okay. So maybe I'll say, uh, I, think that, I think that if the European doing that, it's really bad for the European you know, uh, the community as a whole because there are really no big module manufacturing in Europe. There's no wafer manufacturing in Europe, right? So it's really, it's a, all, you, all you're doing is just make sure that, you know, the, all the European actually, uh, the industry, solar industry, a lot of them are in capital equipment. They are in, you know, downstream, they're building solar farms. So all that cost, you know, now all the panel costs are going to increase. So they're, they're now the economic will not, no longer work. Look at Germany, right? The return, project returns are single digit. You know, now all of a sudden you have a panel price jumping by 50, 50 to 100%. You no longer have this case anymore. So that actually spelled the death of the European solar market. And for GCL, for us, actually, we think, you know, there's a, some positive effect because what's happening, you're going to start trade wars. So all of a sudden, China is going to retaliate. They're going to put uh, like a trade barrier for European, you know, poly manufacturing, wafer manufacturing come to China. And we are the only guy in town in China. The Chinese market is about 10 gigawatt, you know, a year, plus US, plus other country, Japan, right? So, so we have only about, what, eight or 10 gigawatt, you know, capacity. For us, you know, hey, great, if you do that, you know, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be able to survive. It's probably not good for many of the panel manufacturers because they have more than 60% of the export to Europe. It's so so just bad. to review, Theoretically, you think that trade barriers are a problematic thing, but in terms of GCL, terrific, because suddenly the Chinese government, the EU and the US impose tariffs, the Chinese government retaliates by imposing tariffs, yeah. suddenly your competitors uh, in the US and China, their polysilicon is more expensive than yours, and you guys are sitting pretty. 
Yeah, I see Hemlock, uh, uh, Walker, right, OCI, the only you know, three big guys. Right? The, the poly only like four or five guys. So if all three guys cannot import to China, where can they buy a poly and wafer from? You know, so GCL. GCL. So actually, I, I'm going to be sitting there pretty. Say, okay, I don't like trade war, you know, but you know, it's, that's reality. Terry, you, know, you so, wanted to yeah. jump in. Yeah, the uh, you know, <laughs> it's it's maybe from his point of view, but but uh, you know, in this case, no women uh, situation. I mean, he said he, can, he he's going to win, but uh, I don't think. I'm not saying we're no. going to win, but I'm, I'm going to be uh, surviving, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the, the point is, the uh, you know, U.S. has already imposed that uh, sanction already, right? Anti-dumping, any subsidies that's imposed uh, last year. And look at the, uh, the U.S. project developer return actually coming down. The market, you know, when, when project developer, the project owner buy the panel, actually the pay high price than the peers in Europe and, and other places in the world. And the, and the squeeze the, pro, the, the investors and the project the, the return. So that's actually impact the people here in jobs and people in uh, the, the scale economy and the, the, the sector. And the Europe, and uh, you know, as Peter mentioned that the you know, preliminary hearing is gonna be in, taking place in, in June. Yeah. On the EU tariffs. Yeah, EU yeah. tariffs. Yeah. I mean, that's the scope of business could be larger. And that's detrimental to Chinese panel manufacturers. To be, to be clear, yeah. just, just to explain terms here, the U.S. is a much smaller market or has been for, for Chinese panel makers than the European Union has That's been. That's correct. So it's one thing for the U.S. to impose tariffs. Yeah. It's quite another thing for the EU to impose tariffs. So the decision that's, that's coming up next month yeah. is going to be much more consequential for you guys than what happened over the last year with the um, U.S. Yes, that's correct. Uh, actually, not necessarily. So in the U.S., you know, uh, the tariff actually has almost minimal impact on China. The reason is because U.S., uh, really, the, uh, the tariff is on, you know, uh, you know China made solar cells. So right now, a lot of people, they're not doing the solar cells. The panel manufacturing, like China and everybody else, they're sourcing the solar cell from Taiwan. They're actually shipping the wafer to Taiwan. Then Taiwan make their solar cells and ship it back to China and making the module ship to U.S. So they actually, they actually avoid that, uh, you know, that, uh, this uh, tariff. But uh, you know, you know, it's bad for U.S. because U.S. is seeing the, you know, the panel price increase by five to ten cents. Not a huge amount, like three hundred percent, you know, whatever the tariff is. But you know, still livable, right? But Europe is different, and Europe is, you know, this tariff is on everything, from wafer to cell to uh, panels. So European, that's why it's more detrimental. It's a blow to the entire, you know, China mo module manufacturer because everything. You have to move all the factory to Europe. If you do that, your cost is going to you know, go through the roof. You, know, you cannot source you know, to any, everything outside, right? So you think that essentially the EU imposing these tariffs would be Europe biting the hand that feeds it? Yeah, because you know, all the cost to Europe is going to go so high. You know, how does Germany can survive the feeding tariffs going down so low already? You know, your project return already single digit. So you know, they no longer can make the economic work. J just to be clear, what we've been talking about are what you'd like to see happen. Forget, it, forget what you'd like to see happen. What do you think is going to happen? Oh, For yeah. preliminary hearing in June, uh, still a battle right now, because uh, um, I think that the, the, we work with the alliance over there and to see if we can fight back on the, US, uh, the European uh, yeah, Commercial com uh, Committee on this issue. And also the other one is, because uh, within Europe, we have alliance because of the supply chain it's not that every, all the European companies benefit from that. It's only the module maker, like solar world, to some degree, moderate benefit. But most of the company in, in Europe is not benefit, they actually get hurt. Now, like a poly maker, you know, they, they, when the majority of used customers of the poly is Chinese module maker. So they get hurt. And the other one is equipment side. Equipment, if, if the Chinese module makers get hurt, and the, the equipment from, U, uh, from Germany, from uh, Europe, and they, they have to reduce their- Your their, point is that Chinese mm. solar panel manufacturers are largely buying equipment to make those panels from Lot European companies. At least companies. we have. And if, US, the, yeah. if the panels that come out of these Chinese yeah. factories are somehow uneconomic because That's of tariffs, it That's hurts, yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's, let's just, let's move on here, and, and there may be questions about this tariff fight, which we'll get, we'll get into in the, in the question and answers. Um, I wanna talk about, we've talked about the history of what China has done uh, to build up the solar industry, sort of the, the, the hemorrhaging that's happening now. 
What is going on with this attempted rationalization in China? I mean, it's clear to me from having been to Beijing and Shanghai a few right. times recently that there that there is massive thought being given at the highest levels of the Chinese government to how to restructure the Chinese solar industry for the long haul. You guys obviously mm -hmm. are thinking on a corporate level about how you restructure your own companies mm -hmm. for the right. long haul. Yeah. Explain to us in some detail what exactly is happening, both in terms of policy in China, in terms of the bank's behavior, and in terms of your own company's behavior yeah. to try to stanch the bleeding and move forward in a sustainable way? Yeah. I think a rational, rationalization is taking place, and it's, it's taking time. It's been uh, slowly recognized by, by those you know, painful lessons to learn. And starting in 2011, because in the early days, the Chinese government you know, didn't believe the solar going to be applied in Chinese market because it's too expensive. And later on, in a couple of things, and you know, changing the mind. One is the, the cost coming down quickly. The secondly is the, you know, the pricing, the, the profitability is decreased dramatically. They think that the, the Chinese manufacturing getting in trouble. So they have the force them to think about open up the domestic markets. So that's why they have added the, the incentive programs such as the Golden Sun, and those uh, and feeding tariff down, they come into be more uh, long-term view on this uh, support on this solar So sectors. to be clear, yeah. essentially, as you, as you said before, I mean, initially when the Chinese solar industry developed, it was almost exclusively an export industry. As the overcapacity developed, the Chinese government realized it had to incentivize a domestic Chinese market to try to sop up some of that yeah. overcapacity. Correct. But you, you mentioned Golden Sun. Yeah. So Golden Sun, is a program that the Chinese government deployed to, uh, it, it's, a, it's an incentive program for domestic Chinese solar projects. It's quite interesting, actually. There have been, there's been real criticism of the efficiency of the Golden Sun right. program, right? Tell it, just tell us before we move to Peter, tell us sure. about that. What was the problem with that subsidy system and what's happening now? Golden Sun, uh, and initially the government wouldn't want to promote the, the sector and said, okay, easy to do to monitor is the, you know, reimburse 50% on your investment on the, on the panel. If you on, invest on the in a solar farm, the, the government writes you a check for 50% of 50%, your cost. 50%, yeah. And it turned out, and also the, on a quarter, because each province has only about, like, initially it's 25 megawatts first, and then they expand it. And they found out, and because uh, there were loop, loophole in there, and because some of the installer put there, or project developer there, they get a reimbursement and take it out and sell those panel to system to other people. So actually get money is hard to monitor. It's not an end user and monitoring system. So that's why the, the, uh, the, the will the decide to stop that uh, program in this year. Yeah. The Golden Sun is a you know, comment on Golden Sun because it, it is designed to upfront payment. So that you know, it kind of opened up a lot of fraud. You inflate the cost, then you know, they can get a cost reimbursed. So, the, so I think that program is going to die. The government is more you know, open to like a pay, pay per use. If you sell me electricity, I'll pay you, right? I think that, that's probably gonna, that's to, gonna to, happen. To be that's clear, for, for, forgive me for being, for, for being really basic here, but um, the Golden Sun program was an incentive based not on how much electricity you produced with your solar farm. It was an incentive based on how much money you spent putting in the solar farm. Right? So there was no yeah. incentive for any kind Correct. of efficiency with yeah. this. It was, you, you, you got your money from the government for installing the panels, and yeah. whatever happened to the panels after that, it was no longer your concern. Correct. 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 And the yeah. other thing, and, uh, and uh, loop out there, because uh, when you apply in the program in China, and you go through the process of feasibility study, the time you put a feasibility study, and you estimate your investment in per watt basis, but the time, and uh, when you implement it, it's about a half year later, the pricing coming down already, cost coming down, mm. and use that one as reference to get a reimbursement. But ta the time you actually deploy the system, it's the cost much much lower. You actually, you get a, in terms of percentage-wise, you get a much higher in the reimbursement from, yeah. from the government. Terry, uh, Peter, talk for a minute about the, the behavior of the banks. What are the banks doing now differently from what you were describing earlier as the bank's behavior in 2009, yeah. okay. 2010. So look at the, the China, the, the Suntai case, or you know, LDK, a lot of big names. So the biggest uh, uh, bank getting hurt are the two big banks, CDBs, Bank of China. CDB, China Development yeah, yeah. Bank. China bank Development China. Bank of China. Ch Ch CDB is a government bank, it's really the biggest bank in China. Now the former head of CDB now is running the China you know, Department of the Treasury. So you can see how is they're inter interrelated. So, right, this, so they get hurt big time. 
So they, you know, I don't think the Chinese government is going to sit tight, let the you know, bank really suffer big time because it is an important bank for the company. Number two is, uh, you know, also a lot of a company that create a lot of jobs, economy for the, for the, you know, for the, for the, for the government. So they would like to keep that, right? So number two, two is in the second reason. The third reason, if you look at the solar, you know, like Terry said before, uh, the cost become very reasonable now. So we, we did a calculation, I think it did, you know, only need a 0.2 pennies, uh, you know, charge a surcharge of 0.2 pennies per kilowatt hours to the users, you'll be able to sustain, you know, to support all the renewable programs for, for both wind and the solar. So when the government coming to the you know, realization now, now I, can, I can help the industry, I can support it. That's why you see you know, there's a policy calling for 10 gigawatt a year for China solar industry because there's a need for the banks. You don't want to see bank go belly up. You don't want to see the company going belly up. At the same time, you can afford it. You, just, you can just charge some you know, surcharge. You can afford you, you it. China can, can yeah, afford China it. can afford it, right? You can because the cost coming down so, so, so much you should be able to support, support so, it. So we're sitting here talking about China as a monolith. China can do this, China can do that. But obviously, China, just like the United States, is not one entity, right? It's many, mm -hmm. many entities. And it seems to me that it's important to note that Beijing can say what Beijing says. But the mm -hmm. ex Beijing can talk about rationalizing this industry mm -hmm. and, and trying to define banks' behavior. But the extent to which the provinces yeah. listen to what Beijing says is unclear, right? Each province has its mm -hmm. own interest in continuing to support its own solar company. Yeah. So I wonder what is, in reality, it's a pretty messy attempt at rationalization, no? I, th yeah. I think they have an issue right now, rationalization, and recognized, and started recognized by central government and, uh, and the central bank as well. But locally, there was regional province, and they have a, and got uh, some of the you know, obstacles they have to overcome is regional. Uh, province level, they want to have uh, uh, promote their own economy, and support their own and, uh, companies, and the other one is a bank, and really hesitate to write off their loans, the, the bad loans. So they want to support, keep the it, it, the company as it is, so that uh, so that they have to don't have to write off the uh, their loans. Because in China, they have a very strict policy for the to write off the loans, and because that's a, mm. the default going to going to jeopardize their the, the political life on the, on those, uh, the bank head. At the banks. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I want to switch gears. Is there yeah. something you want to say really quickly yeah, on this think, issue uh, of banks? For the banks, I was just talking to one of the bank uh, managers uh, just a few days ago, you know, Bank of China. So that right now, they're, you know, you know, uh, not even the uh, local provincial levels, they need to report to back to Beijing, the central banks. They actually can start controlling the loan to solar. Because right now, solar is on a watch list. You're not, you know, I, you know, you really see a bank actually increasing the loan limit. They actually, you know, right now solar become a bad names. If you want to make a loan to solar, you better have a very good reason to do that. <laughs> right, so. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, so I want to switch gears, and I, we're going we're gonna to open this up to question, your questions in about five minutes. But I want to cover two other things before you do that. The first mm -hmm. thing I want to cover is the economics of solar. So um, as everyone, most people in this room know, the price, and you guys have mentioned, the price of modules has fallen dramatically over the past few years. I wonder, what is the reason for that? Have, have, have prices fallen because of great technological gains? Or have prices fallen for, because of capacity? Or what's the reason? Maybe we can first comment. He can come later. So, so on the on the price, price has nothing to do with the cost at all. It's just pure market. You know, see supply demand driven. But, you know, you can. Is there no reason why the price has to be high as low? It's, it's purely depend by the supply supply demand. I think before the price was four dollars. People making thirty three percent margins. There's no reason they should make that thirty three percent margin. I mean, the technology is not that fancy. It's you know, it's compared with uh, you know, rocket science, it's, it's almost like nothing. So I think it's a commodity business. And right now, the overcapacity, right? So the price is coming down. It's just as, simp as simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. Terry? I add this. Uh, uh, I think that the government, the feed entail policy, regulatory policy change, and pick a very important role. If we look at the in 2011, and Germany make two cuts or three cuts on the feed entail, and which is abnormal compared to what they cut in the past few years by 10 percent. So the cut at the beginning of the year, 10 percent, and in April and the mid. It's total about 30, 35 percent, and uh, so that give people the uh, cut in Germany's feed-in tariff, feed-in tariff, yeah. about three times within right. six months. Right, right. So that's created the, the panic for the sectors, and the people created the the pool. In fact, 
and to create a temporary demand in the early days. And suddenly, when, when the, uh, the feeding, uh, feeding tariff effective and the demand shut down quickly and dramatically de uh, below the average. So that's why the pricing, by the time, because you don't have sales, and the people here supply and versus the demand, oversupply also created like a 10 gigawatts inventory in channel. So that the, the project developer and those guys, even margin sub supplier, want to sell those panels and try to lower price as much as it can so that they can sell it. So that's why the pricing dropped dramatically is because of that and demand and supply so, so, and driven by this. So uh, let me just be product. clear. I mean, at the risk, again, of being really basic here, what you're describing is an extraordinary decline in the cost of a techno in the price of a technology yeah. to the market. Yeah. But that's what you're saying is that's really not the result of any massive technological improvement in solar no. energy. No. That's the result of market forces and essentially massive overcapacity. That's correct. Right. Yeah. yeah. Overcapacity we just talked about early days you know, it's about 60 gigawatts range at this as of today. It, it's, it's been, you know, last year is pretty slow because of people, you know, overcapacity already. If you put in the, you know, future year and then the past few years before that time, it's added at the capacity about 10 gigawatts each year. It's, it's massive. But the time when people realize overcapacity, oversupply is already versus demand, it's too late. And the, the inventory people like us, we cannot sell. And we look around and we see the project developer owner said, we have tons of the panel in our storage. We cannot even install. Yeah. We're not going to buy it. So that's, so, that's the reason. So, so I have 16 more questions I want to ask you, but I'm going to stop in a second and let the rest of the room ask questions. Um, but I guess what the, the question that that begs is, if, if, the, if the price improvements in the recent years aren't really related to technological development. They're really related to market overcapacity. What, how hopeful are you looking forward that there's going to be any kind of great technological improvement in solar? And let's not just limit ourselves to polysilicon-based PV. But if you look out, you're obviously doing this strategically for where you guys are placing your bets in your own companies. Right. What do you see as really promising? Do you see a technology that's going to be a kind of game changer in solar? Or is solar going to continue to be tiny incremental technological gains, an industry supported by subsidies, and the, the, the vicissitudes of the market uh, you know, determine from, the future? From my point of view, maybe um, Peter can talk a little bit the uh, poly and poly side. From Marjo's point of view, you know, I think that if we look at the, uh, in the past few years, the cost continued to fall. Mm -hmm. Even the late, later years, is in, uh, in terms of the decline the rate, it's slower than the pricing drop, but, but the pattern is still coming down. It's driven by some technology that's improved the, uh, the efficiency by 0.5% uh, each year, efficiency, and same time running the cost and on an uh, excellent operation on a non poly process cost area. So that we think is coming to, you know, if you buy those materials in, into consideration, it's, it's a room is getting, getting there, but it's not the come to the floor, but it's come approaching that. Um, Technology-wise, I think that the, you know, we will see next few years, couple years, of uh, silicon-based and technology is not going to be too much breakthrough, in our view, in the next two to three years. Maybe five years later, we have other uh, material, new materials to replace current one, then we can have a, a massive, uh, significant improvement. But current, we don't see that in, in short term. So is there going to be yeah. some other technology beyond polysilicon PV that's going to be a game changer in the next five years? If, if, yeah, that we, we, we think so. But what, that's going what, to be take a it? longer time. <laughs> you know, it's, it's so much here, you know, people are talking about thin film, but thin film is not working right now. Look at the solar. They cannot even compete with the silicon uh, module. They want to do, instead of they do their own So it's project. not thin film. What is it? It's a combination <laughs> of both. Okay. I, I would say yeah. in silicon and thin film, and a lot of uh, the tons of technology right now in research in this topic. And, uh, you know, some got very high efficiency, some got low cost. But you have to balance both, then that's, that's going to be challenging. Here. Yeah, I think if you look at the last few years, I think there's technology advancement as well. You know, over the last few years, actually the price and technology are kind of in sync in terms of cost reduction. Every year is like 20, 30%. 
from last year to this year, I think that that is really you know you will see a, you know big uh, kind of uh, disruptions, right? You know, the price <laughs> dropping like more than fifty percent. The cost is dropping down, but it's not as fast. In my view, I think silicon, I think it still have a long lag to go. You know, right now, I think silicon uh, production cost is at sixteen or eighteen dollars. I see it going down, below, you know, fifty percent more below, you know, below ten dollars. This, by yeah. the way, is a silicon maker talking yeah, yeah, to yeah. you. Right? Okay. <laughs> there's FPR technology, which a lot of companies are developing. They can go down further. I think there's, uh, you know, wafer cutting technology can reduce, uh, you know, the wafer thickness, right? How much wafer you're going to use, and uh, increase your capacity by, you know, you know, two hundred percent, right? Because you can use, like diamond wires, right? Then also a technology you're doing a combination of, uh, you know, kind of. Uh, you know, uh, two axis tracking instead of, you know, like a fixed tilt, right? You increase your production number 15%, but your cost doesn't increase as much. So your levelized cost of energy decreased substantially, right? You can do a combination of high more efficiency. More efficient placement of the solar panels. Yes, kind of, exactly, okay. right? You can I'm, track in the sun, but very, very low cost, right? Right now, you know, I see, I know, uh, interesting, I see some companies that have this two axis tracking technology, which have very low cost, almost like the cost of a fixed tilt. Immediately, you have 15% of efficiency, you know, coming 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 at you. Then you have you know other company doing some kind of a CPV technology coming down. There is some limitation with CPV, but still CPV concentrating. Concentrating, yeah, right. I see yeah. some of that. You know, that at good solar conditions, you can cut down the cost. You know, I I can see a roadmap. You can cut the polysilicon based uh, you know uh, uh, module. Uh, you know, system coming down to com compete with uh, coal fire power. Okay, so so we're going to turn to questions, but the, the message to the market is that GCL believes there's going to continue to be a demand for GCL's product for a long time to come. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Uh, who has questions and students first? Go ahead, Arjun. Yeah. yeah, so we understand that China has a low cost in this industry, and, and we've also seen from Trina's earnings releases that Trina has one of the lowest cost as well. Can you help us to understand why why is the cost so low? In particular, can you speak about the importance of the Trina PV park and the manufacturing collaboration <coughs> between your two firms? Yeah. And Trina, uh, the, we become um, the cost leader and since uh, uh, early 2009. And uh, after uh, many, so we... we, we well, cost we, leader means what specifically? Cost means the non-poly process cost it's uh, number one in the sector. Lowest. Yeah, lowest. Yeah. Lowest means that, because uh, that's involved non-poly, we separate with the poly material that's driven by purchase price of poly. But the non-poly is, is driven by the fact that like, you know, efficiency you know, of operation, excellent operation, high yield, low breakage, and uh, the manager of supply chain, and uh, efficient technology, and uh, that will be, for example, the time or uh, reduce the usage of the material. The time we had, uh, you know, I joined a company that was uh, uh, per watt usage is about like 7.5 gram. Now we're coming down 5.5 gram or five, close to five. So you're getting much more efficient with the use of the material. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the other thing is because the trainer itself, they have a separate a little bit different because the time we, 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 we create the models called a vertical integrated model. So we'll put everything compact in the same site and uh, the vertical integrated and we set up the, cam the campus with the five megawatts and the product line next to each, uh, each other like a wafer, cell and module. They don't have to, because when you move to next line, you don't have, you, you minimize your breakage you minimize your, your inventory, the, those type of things. And the versus other people, they have to buy, you know, some of the, like a GCL wafer and uh, buy there and ship over here and then ship to the module uh, site and a thousand miles away. So that's the, and also the, we, we're looking for internally, we're running the so-called the uh, on real time monitoring process to monitor our quality and the cost on a real-time basis. So I think this is actually just an important thing just to place a marker here. I mean, we, there's a lot of discussion, and perhaps some of you will ask questions about this notion of innovation and to what extent China is innovating versus the extent to which the U.S. is innovating in, in solar or other clean energy technologies. And it seems to me that one reading of what Terry has just said is that there, it, this is a bit of it. This is innovation. This is not sort of 
uh, Silicon Valley style breakthrough innovation, but the kind of layout of the yeah, factory that you're talking about, operational efficiencies, uh, at least in the view of some people, constitute themselves innovation. Sure. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. you, yeah. um, let's, yeah. Do you want to jump in or you want to? Yeah, yeah, maybe I'll just come on, come on. I think if you look at the panel manufacturing, there's all about I mean, so much materials. Basically, the, the panel manufacturers are material assemblers. 80% of the cost in material. You basically, you know, the, so the, the game of the, you know, is really how do you minimize the material usage? What Terry mentioned is they want to, you know, Trina actually did a good job, right? It did, you know, minimize the material usage and reduce your cost. But uh, overall, you know, there, I think all the panel manufacturers, they're on par to each other. You know, Trina may be good, but there are not huge difference between, the, you know, all the, all the peers. So you need a game changer really to yeah. reduce the cost substantially. Yeah. Other questions? The, the other one thing I want to add is things, because in China, that's what I said, China make uh, the panel so cost competitive is because the supply chain is built up and nearby mm -hmm. in Thai food chain. So that's very <coughs> important. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jia. Uh, so you, you mentioned the CDV and Bank of China will suffer uh, substantial loss in your loans. You also have substantial equity exposure to many solar industries in China. Do you feel their holding of equity stakes in this enterprise is actually compromised their decision to make loans in supporting the growth of the overcapacity of Chinese solar industry? Did everyone hear that question? The question is basically, does the fact that certain large Chinese banks not only have made loans, but also have made equi taken equity stakes in Chinese mm. solar players compromise the objectivity of the bank's decision about whether to continue to extend loans. Yeah? I, I don't yeah. think that's going to be the case right now in China. Because China bank very strictly, they have a regulatory policy. I don't know your company. And I don't know if bank take equity of the uh, uh, company. It's going to be uh, high ranking approval. It's, it's not the bank is bank. They just loan the debt financing. And they don't do the, the equity financing because in China. Yeah. But for the bankruptcy company, if they for have companies a companies in bankruptcy, yeah. 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 And, uh, and uh, if they do the, the restructure of the loan or restructure the company, they have some solution to, you know, on the table. And they could have this is one of the solutions to take some of the equity mm. or take the loan converted to the equity and they can take the equity stake. But that's yeah. not going to be big, because look at the uh, net assets of the equity in the current, the, the, the company in bankruptcy is very small. It's not going to solve the, uh, the, bank, the, uh, the loan issue. Yeah, I was looking at uh, uh, some of the companies that are in the earning report. Right? One, one of the company, I would not name the company. You sure? They, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they have over $2 billion, uh, $2 billion in, uh, in uh, bank debt. Right, but the, the interest payment of that is like $60 million a quarter. So, but their revenue is around $80 million to $100 million. So they're, you know, they would not have enough money if you just uh, give all the revenue to the banks to cover the interest payment, we were barely. So what happened is right now, many banks are you know, trying to make sure they're not writing up their, you know, their borrowing is, hey, maybe we kind of let you go on the interest payment, you know, for a while. Then, you know, kind of all the, almost like a quasi equity, right? Because they do not want to do the write off. That's why you see some of the companies are still surviving because, you know, there's, uh, they try to, uh, you know, save their, uh, you know, their investment. Again, just, just at, at the let, risk let, of, yeah. Let me, let me comment, because mm -hmm. I don't want to miss the uh, uh, concept that every, every company like that is, uh, exists in China. Because only a couple of brain, large companies have a big social influence, might have that treatment. A small company, yeah. And the, the bank showed them no mercy and take all the loan away and let them die. I mean, that's different. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, please, right here. Yeah. So if you're a, a grad student working on PV, would you start a new type of PV technology? Would you start a company right now, or would you go somewhere else and wait it out a couple of years and then start a company? <laughs> actually, I would uh, start right now. Theoretical question, yeah, purely, yeah, Actually, right? yeah. Yeah, so timing is perfect. <laughs> Right now, the market is done. It's good to work on technology. Uh, but by our estimate, by 2015, supply demand will be out of balance again, right? Because the supply is still pretty healthy. And bear in mind, supply is, you know, is very good supply. So you have 30 gigawatt, you know, that's huge. And going in, you know, in the next two years, it's going to be over 50 gig gigawatt. I mean, this, uh, the industry has a long leg to go. If you have a you know, breakthrough technology, I would definitely encourage you to 
start a company if you can find a VC to support it. Because a lot of VC would say, you know, if, as soon as they hear solar, they say, oh, man, maybe, maybe we'll wait for a few years. So Let me add on that, because uh, I agree with Peter, now is a good time. And uh, if you look at the forward scene in the future, in the next couple of years, the, the, the demand will pick up. And uh, you know, demand and supply will rebalance. But the point is, if, don't repeat the current, you know, the, the business model. You have to create a business model with new technology. That's going to be in fact in the next few years, and that's people are looking for. And uh, I think that uh, if you have that compelling story to the VC, they will give you money. Mm -hmm. There was a question over here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My question is actually um, kind of related to the previous question. So uh, obviously for you two, in the long term, you are very uh, positive about the whole solar market. But I'm wondering in the short term, in terms of the business strategies of your companies and other Chinese uh, manufacturers who are struggling with the market, what are some of the big strategies you are uh, using to kind of meet the investors' perspective, both for uh, domestic Chinese investors and also uh, overseas um, investors like the, the U.S. equity market? Did everyone hear that? Raise your hand if you didn't hear that. So the question was basically wonderful to talk about the trajectory for the industry. What are you guys doing to stay alive? Yeah. Right? I mean, I mean, for us, it's actually pretty simple. I think what you need to do, we are, we're doing polysilicon wafers. Right now, there's only four or five players. I think that will be the first sector getting out of our supply demand uh, unbalance. So what we need to focus on to make sure you make a very good product, very low cost. So that, I think that's number one. Don't forget what, you, what you're making. So focus on the products. Number two, you know, we are also looking at you know, expand downstream. That's why you know, I'm, we are you know, going global to develop a lot of you know, uh, solar uh, farms you know, everywhere. You know, we are doing uh, anywhere around 500 to a gigawatt solar farms globally. So the interns actually create a lot of demand for our uh, upstream you know, products. So that will help us to, you know, to absorb all this over To be clear, you, you live in the Bay Area. Right, yeah. and your job is international project development, essentially for GCL. Right, Correct. this is what you do: is yeah. developing solar farms for GCL products, largely. Yeah, to give you an example, in a company last year, in our office, we actually developed over 500 megawatt solar projects, and you can bet every single project we're going to use GCL made wafers. <laughs> <laughs> Terry, okay. you, uh, what, that, in the, you know, those other questions. What is what is what is Trina yeah. doing basically to, Trina, to shore itself um, up? Trina, look a little bit beyond the current stage. You know, we, we always want to, but the current, your know, near term and longer term, near term, and uh, we'll focus on what we've done the best, which is a, as cost leader module maker. So we set up a business unit. At the same time, we 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 have the system unit built up and built downstream, because downstream in China is good timing. If you sell module, you don't make money. But if you uh, have a project developer and build the plan, and you can make money in China, if you're good at it, that's what build the team capability. But beyond that, also we're looking at long term, and we can create another trainer by looking at the different related technologies, so such as the storage technologies and other, you know, Environment friendly and real estate green and the, the uh, energy saving and project that can do, and even battery area. So that so, we, so you're diversifying beyond beyond simply making that's, panels. That's that's we have the plan ahead. So for mm -hmm. next five or ten years, what's been look like if it, what's the position and trainer will be, and if we, and for one one thing is certain, and the module maker is not going to be high margin <coughs> business anymore, if by the time break even or low margin, so barely make a much uh, lower single digit uh, the net margin. So that's going to be in the phenomenon going forward. So we want to have a large advantage division uh, asin for, uh, for from our competitors. Then we have to create other the field that we we, we plan ahead. One one happens. last question. Who's itching to ask a question uh, in the white shirt there? You described uh, solar as being a commodity. Um, in that respect, do you see in the future a lot of consolidation of these uh, solar companies into uh, much larger true energy companies? Or do you think that solar companies will survive as a standalone so like a shell just by everybody out there? Right. Yeah, this one is uh, we've been discussing internally and the battle or this hit, uh, hit topic. 
Now, you know, we heard the, you know, the things come in like a GE or other, you know, uh, company outside of uh, solar has come in to, to take over. But I, uh, we, we analyze, I think the solar standalone can survive, but they need some other technology or other um, technology to apply and uh, to run the, the, the industry more efficiently. And I think that the consolidation within and the solar itself also taking place help the, the, the industry health growth. But, uh, but uh, we welcome, we, we do see if this is right now, they don't come. And, uh, but the investor from outside, they will come because when the pricing come to, you know, down to group parity or competitive conventional, and for, if they see that, that features come, I think they will come and create a more competitiveness. I think that the both are okay. I mean, and the one is a uh, solar cell without other company to other industries coming, still survive. What's the for future for the US in, in the solar industry? Future? What's the future for the US? Can the US manufacture solar panels or is that game over? And if not, what does the US do? I think that's gonna be tough for them because the not the cost competitive enough, but, uh, but, you know, but they, they done pretty good uh, transition. Uh, first solar, some power and the cost structure higher, but they do the transition right now to move the downstream and they located or secure all the, the projects itself in, in, in Europe mm -hmm. or in, in US and they use their own panel and they make money on that. So that helped them to gain the market share and profit. So they happen to be a US company, but they produce the panels elsewhere and they're deploying the panels That's elsewhere. That's correct right now. Peter? I think a US company can do very well because it depends on what you have, right? I think if you're gonna just compete, you know, just on pair with the Chinese company, just purely compete on labor and assembly, then you're gonna lose. But you give in a good example, some power they're doing great, right? Because they have a good you know, high, you know, play on the technology front, right? They're making profitable, they're making their product a welcome you know, on the rooftop, perfect, right? They have, you know, uh, Japan, they are getting good deployment. They have their, you know, C7 product coming out, right? You know, low concentration CPUs. I mean, you just have to play the technology game. Don't compete on the same front, right? You know, that's where US is good at it. I think the US has, you know, has great advantage of that. Same thing with uh, First Solar. They are just announced they're gonna make 18%, you know, you know, solar panel efficiency. I mean, that, I think they can compete well, if they, you know, compete, can, can, you know, leverage what they're good at, not, on the same front, compete on labor costs. Now, that's, you know, if you compete on that, you're going to lose. Excellent. Well, I know that there are lots more questions, so I thank you very much for turning out. We're going to have to cut it off here, but let me just say that there is a, some uh, food and drinks just outside these doors afterward for a while, so you have ample opportunity to, uh, to run up to these guys and ask them questions. Um, I want to thank uh, Terry Wong and Peter Xia very much for taking their time here today, and I think for for being pretty open with us about what's going on in their industry. Um, I just want to say by way of, of, of looking forward that there are two more installments in this Rising Power series. One next Monday, I'll talk about um, the, the, uh, the effect on uh, the US of what's going on in China in energy broadly. And then uh, the, two weeks from today, we'll have um, Zhongying uh, Wang, who is the number two uh, at the Energy Research Institute of the NDRC, the National Development and Reform Commission in Beijing, one of, Be one of China's top energy planners, um, sort of sending this series out by looking forward uh, uh, with, with China's view of what's going to happen in its energy system. So thank you guys very much. Thank you very much. And join us outside, please. <laughs>